Hi, my name is Aaron Walker. I'm founder of Iron Sharpens Iron Mastermind, and I want to invite you to listen today on leadership and loyalty as I really dive deep into an automobile accident that I had where it radically changed my life. You know, there was a time in my life that I literally was going to kill someone that stole a business deal from me. And I'm talking at length about this. But on the other side of that, isolation is the enemy to excellence. And if you want to live a life that takes you to heights you've never been, stay tuned and listen as we go deep. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dolph Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dolph Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives. Look, no one listening to this show is going to say success is unimportant. However, a far more important thing is to consider what's actually driving your pursuit of success. As we've spoken about many times on this podcast, success without commitment to adding significant value to others is unlikely to bring you any level of lasting fulfillment. So what does it take to go from success to significance and on to fulfillment? Can you do it alone by being massively driven or does it take others? And if it does take teaming up with others, how do you know who to team up with? Well, stay tuned because that's where we're going in the next two episodes as we embark on a journey from success to significance. As always, we need your help in staying relevant. So please do us a favor. Get over to wherever it is that you tune into the podcast and rate, review, and subscribe to the show. It really helps and it helps us to stay relevant. We do appreciate it. If you are a regular listener, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. We are honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. By the way, I know you're curious. I'm Dov Barron. I am your host, and I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything by transforming meaning into action. Curious to know more? Simply go to DovBaron.com. That's D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N.com. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. We've all heard the saying, success is a journey rather than a destination. However, we've all met people, sometimes in the mirror, who despite knowing it's a journey, treat it like a defining destination. They somehow believe that they will be something different when they get there, wherever there is. Then, to their great disappointment, they discover that they've worked their butt off, and as a result, they have all the shiny things on the outside, and they are often empty on the inside. Our guest for the next two episodes... So, uh, Our guest for the next two episodes knows all about that. Aaron Walker is a veteran entrepreneur. He's a man with a multi-layered story of success without significance, of anger and hate, and his journey towards forgiveness, fellowship, community, and service. He is a man who's been on the edge of personal hell and made it back to guide others towards something far more meaningful. He's had 14 businesses and he's retired three times, the first time at just 27 years old. Then something life-altering happened when he was 40 years old that would take him down a very dark path to the bottom where he had to do massive self-inquiry in order to come back and share his view from the top. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me to welcome the best-selling author of View From The Top, Living a life of significance and founder of, of Iron Shop and Iron Mastermind Group, Live up to that, Dove, but thank you, man, for having me on as your guest. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here today. I am certain you can more than live up to it. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure and honor to have you here. Really looking forward to it. I really enjoyed our past conversation. And I want to start where we always start, which is in the context of leadership development. Uh, 
What's the most frustrating thing you see, the thing that seems to be glaring obvious that so often is uh, ignored or dismissed by leaders and organizations? You know, when I was a young guy starting my first business at 18 years old, a man, seasoned veteran, told me to really pay attention to the customers. He said, customer service will always serve you well. And over the course of my lifetime, it feels as though that's dissipated to some level. I even did a piece on it about a week ago about customer service and the lack of it. it's very evident in our workplace today. A lot of the young people are not getting taught what real customer service is about. And I did about a half hour uh, interview just last week on this very topic. And I think Leadership needs to be paying more attention to customer service today, more so than ever before. But to me, it feels like it's gone awry. You know, I I have to agree with you. um, But the pushback is we're in the great resignation. Um, We all know, I know, can't even name how many businesses saying, I just can't get people. And, And if people come in, you know, they stay an hour or they stay till lunch and then they bugger off and they're not here anymore. And if I tell them, you know, I'd like you to serve this client better, they go, oh, well, I'm out. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. It is more difficult today as a result of the pandemic, us going through that. And uh, we can get off on the political side of the reason that many of these people are not working today. I know that's not where we want to go. But I have very good friends of mine that own large companies uh, one of them I'll just mention here, uh, he owns two Chick-fil-A's in Birmingham, and uh, they're absolutely crushing it. They're fully staffed, and the leadership teaches them how to do customer service at a very high level. Yes. And he doesn't tolerate those that won't perform, and if you don't perform, you're out. And uh, he's having to pay more now, obviously, to sure. get people, but uh, there are still people available. It all hinges uh, on leadership. And so yeah. I think we can demand good customer service. I demand it from our group and I have from all of 14 companies that I've owned in the past. It's very important. I think, I think you're absolutely right. And it's interesting. You brought up the example of Chick-fil-A. I wrote about them in uh, my last business book was fiercely loyal because one of the things I talked about was how to keep, how to get top talent and keep top talent. And I talked about Chick-fil-A as an example um, of a purpose-driven organization because whether a person agrees or disagrees with their purpose or their Christian values sure. doesn't really matter. What matters is they believe in it, they hold steady to it, and they don't hide it in any way, shape, or form, and that they hire on that and then everything that they see that goes with that, which is the maxims that is service. And they're a wonderful example of that. And you're absolutely right. I do believe that there are many purpose-driven organizations who said, this is a maxim for us. Service is absolutely non-negotiable at the highest possible level. And if you can't do that, I mean, I, I'm trying to remember the name of the store. One of the stores recently closed um, closed down several days a week because they didn't have enough staff to provide good service every day. So they said we'd rather provide ex- pro- uh, provide excellent service right. a few days a week sure. than average service every day. And I was yeah, like, "Yeah, I'm with wow. them. I'm with That's them." That's such great integrity, though. One hundred percent, right? I agree because the people that are out front, your customers, they can choose to go anywhere. They choose to go there. And if you can't answer the phone properly, greet my clients properly, take care of them with great service. I'll give you a funny little story. Dove, just for a second, Please. I took, took Robin to uh, uh, Alcapulco for her birthday, and uh, we're sitting on the cliffs there having dinner, and the divers are going off the cliffs, and um, we order dinner, and Robin orders a Diet Coke, and he said, oh, ma'am, I'm sorry, we don't carry Diet Coke, and she said, no, not a problem, give me an iced tea or whatever, and he did. We're there for 10 days. Next night, we're at dinner, same place, same restaurant. And uh, the waiter comes up, takes our order. Robin orders tea, but he brings her a Diet Coke. And she said, uh, I, I don't understand. I, I don't drink Coke. He goes, no, no, that, that's that's not Coke. That's Diet Coke. 
She said, well, you told me last night you don't care. And he said, well, I didn't last night, but since you ordered it, I went to the store and bought it. And I'll have it here for the duration of your trip. Yeah. For me, that's customer service. Okay. Oh, yeah. You don't think I took care of that guy, do you? Of course. That's it, absolutely. Right? See, it's the little things. That's what matters. And that's what people are not paying attention to today. And I go in numerous places to shop. And they don't speak. They don't acknowledge I'm there. They don't thank me. And I'm like, that's eroding their business. And the leadership better sit up and pay attention. Yeah, I agree with you. I was in, I was in Iran speaking uh, probably about five, six years ago. I went into a store and I said, uh, you know, a coffee shop. And, and I wanted a coffee. And I said, do you have any nut milk instead of, you know, instead of uh, cow's milk? And they said uh, they didn't know what I meant. And I explained. And it's like, oh, okay. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, and I said, uh, they said, I said, do you have any? And he said, no, but we will. And I said, what do you mean we will? And he, and he sends the guy yeah. out, of the, out of the thing to, and he's running around. This guy came back sweating, running like a maniac from right. store to store trying to bring me nut milk. Right. I right. mean, wow, right. that yeah. service. Yeah, that's so cool. And yeah, we can do really that today, but we've got to teach it. We've got to demand it. My friend at Chick-fil-A has been there 38 years, has two of the highest producing stores in the industry, 240 employees in two stores, a management team of 25. Of those 25, half of them have been there over a decade. And it's yeah. because of the leadership skills that they possess. They demand highest of integrity, great character, great customer service. And those stores continue to be the top producers in that industry. And yeah. so, yeah. So I agree with you. It's hard, it's hard to find, but it all starts with the leadership. Yep. And, and, the, and the willingness to be uncompromising about that. Yeah, I yes. think it's wonderful. Now, as I said in the intro, you had very early success in that you retired first time at 27. You told me what the business was and, and how it was. Just tell our audience a little bit about it. I know you've yeah, probably sure. told this story a thousand times, but it's still, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's like, particularly because of reality TV, it's a, it's a particularly interesting uh, one. That's good. I'll go back just for a moment, just for context. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I live in Nashville, Tennessee. Grew up uh, great parents, but in a very poor environment. Like we didn't have anything, and I, I know I know all about being poor. I wanted better for myself, and so when I was 15 years old, I decided the industry I was going to be in, and it was a place that I was working at a local pawn shop. And at the time. Um, I didn't even know what a pawn shop was. Like, I didn't even know what that industry meant. And he explained it to me and fell in love with the people, loved working in the store, met a couple of guys when I was 18 that was the 21st largest insurance agency in the country at the time. And I approached them one day and said, hey, why don't we take your money, my experience, we'll open our own pawn shop. And they started laughing and they said, how old are you? And I said, I'm 18. They said, we've never had anybody 18 approach us. And I said, well, hey, there's a first time for everything. Let's get back to business. Like, are you interested in doing this? Well, they went to my local church. They went to our community. They went to my school. They really found out that I was a hard worker. And they said, hey, we're going to do this. And so we did. So hmm. They gave me a checkbook, $150,000 in the checkbook, and they said, go open it. And that was a lot of money in the 70s, you know. And Absolutely. It's a lot of money today, but it was especially a lot of money to an 18-year-old in the 70s. A year after I opened the business, my wife graduated from high school. Two weeks later, we get married, and I set her down at our little one-bedroom condo, and I said, Robin, we may never get this opportunity again. Like bro, both of us come from very poor families. I mean, we did you know, Duff, we didn't have, like I was broker than a convict. I mean, I didn't have any money when we first right. started. And I said, we're going to put the money back into the business. We're not going to take any money out. And there's a 10 year loan. We're going to pay it off as fast as possible. And we worked hard. And in 36 months, I paid that $150,000 back and wow. paid for pawn shop. I said, I can do it again. And I continued to do it over and over and over. And then when I was 27 years old, 
a Fortune 500 approached us, made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And I woke up on a Monday morning beside a Robin in bed and said, I don't know what I'm going to do today. And uh, took took about a year, year and a half off. <clears throat> I've got this terrible cough today. I'm sorry. That's okay. And uh, I took about a year and a half off and I gained 50 pounds. And wow. uh, Robin woke me up in the middle of the day and she said, this is not what I signed up for. I went back. <laughs> I went back and bought the pawn shop I started with when I was 13 years old, and uh, we took that to new heights. I mean, we quadrupled the business in about a 10 year period. And I'll be honest with you, my life couldn't have been any better. Like I was mm-hmm. working three days a week. My partner was working three days a week. I had two beautiful daughters, big home, place on the beach, the fancy cars. I had all the stuff. Right? It was good. And one morning, 7.30 in the morning, I was headed to the office, and uh, I I was very involved in my local church. I'd go to our church on Wednesdays, pray for my family, pray for our church, uh, pray that God really give me a sense of direction. And we did that every Wednesday morning for about an hour and a half. Five or six of us got together, and I just left there, and I was on my way to the office. And uh, there was a gentleman crossing the street ahead of me. You kind of alluded to this in the introduction. And the gentleman in front of me paused in the median. There was a four-lane highway. He paused in the median. I looked to my right. There was a bus, city bus that had stopped. He was going to catch the bus. And I noticed that his shoulders went slump and he waited and he was waiting for me to pass. So I accelerated. I was driving a 2001 red Lincoln Navigator. I just bought it. And as uh, soon as I got to this gentleman, he took off running to catch that bus, and he didn't see me. And uh, unfortunately, I, I ran over him. And, uh, man, I want to tell you, at that moment, like it was like watching a slow-motion movie. Like everything yeah. slowed down to a crawl. I'd never been in a circumstance like that, never been in a horrific automobile accident. I pulled over to the side of the road and I grabbed my cell phone and I tried to dial 911 and my hand was shaking so much. Like I literally couldn't dial, like I was wow. shaking. And finally I put my palms together, put the phone between them and I dialed 911. I steadied my hand. I dialed 911. I finally got the courage to turn around and look. And there was this gentleman laying face down in the street. This is a, this is a road that gets probably 40,000 cars a day. It's a very busy highway right here in Nashville. And I uh, get out of the car and I walk over. People are stopping everywhere. They're jumping out of their cars. And all of a sudden, I hear the sirens and the ambulance and the fire trucks and the police cars. And everything comes. And I'm like in a daze, like literally a daze. Like I, I don't even know what just happened. Mm-hmm. And I identified myself and the policeman said, uh, hey, walk over here with me. And I walked over and he put me in the back of the patrol car. And he said, sit right here. I'll be back in a little bit. So he came back. He went around, talked to everybody that was there. And uh, finally, they put him on a gurney, put him in an ambulance and took him away. And the policeman came back, got in the car, asked for my identification. And I said, is the gentleman okay? And he said, no, he's got severe head trauma. And uh, I said, is he going to make it? He said, I don't know. So I said, uh, please, somebody call me and let me know. And he said, you're not going to be charged with anything. Everyone said you were doing everything according to the law. And uh, mm-hmm. went back, got in my car, went went to the office, then finally went home. Saturday morning, I get a call at 930 from Vanderbilt Trauma Unit here in Nashville. And they said, you Mr. Walker? And I said, yes. And they said, I want to tell you, Enrique didn't make it. And I want to tell you, man, my heart just left my body at that time. Like all of the things that were good for me, my family, my business, all that felt insignificant at that moment. I'm sure. Yeah. So I took a little time off and decided to sell the business. I've been chasing money, you know, since I was like 13 years old and uh, went to Robin and told her, I said, I'm retiring. And she said, hey, you do whatever you've got to do. And I did. I took, I took five years off. I sold the business. I took five years off and 
Fast forward, I gained 50 pounds again. Robin goes, here we go again. And went back in business and uh, we had a very successful construction company. And then 12 years ago, I retired for the third and final time. And I went to my mastermind group. Dave Ramsey started a group here in Nashville decades ago. Dave and I have been friends for about 30 years. I sponsored his show for 21 consecutive years. I was his second sponsor. And uh, he was on one radio station in Nashville. There was two employees. So we've been together a long time. And he invited me to join his mastermind group. And that's really the place, Dove, that my life really changed. Once I got involved in that group and I really understood vulnerability and transparency, they were able to work me through this difficult situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, I said forever and ever, uh, I'll be in a mastermind group. And I have been now for decades every single week because I have my own board of advisors. I have people that are non-biased that right walk hand in hand with me and walked me through that difficult situation. And uh, I would never want to repeat that. Uh, but I wouldn't take anything for it because it taught me an invaluable lesson about life. Well, you and I were speaking about this uh, before we went on air and the dark night of the soul. And that, that oftentimes, and, and I said to you, you know, in my experience, 38 years doing this, I haven't met anybody yet who is ready to do the work who hasn't had a dark night of the soul because the the pull towards success the pull towards uh, the shiny objects of the world is mm. great. We live in that world, right? And, sure. and that's and I'm not judging it. Don't get me wrong, but it's not going to bring you anything that's lasting. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I want to back up a little bit because you said something that I think is really important for everybody to pay attention to. So, I think you know that in June 1990, I fell off a mountain and got smashed to pieces. And I would say that at that point, <clears throat> if you'd have asked me, is my life on purpose? Five minutes before, absolutely. Um, am I living my purpose? Absolutely. Um, am I uh, spiritually, soulfully connected? Absolutely. And then you fall off a mountain. In my case, you fall off a mountain. And suddenly you're confronted with this dark night of the soul that makes one ask, what am I really here for? You're the, you know, you described that on that particular day, it's a Wednesday, you've been at the church, you've been praying, you've been doing the work yeah. for the church. You're yeah. obviously a, a, you know, a religious person. You've been embedded in that from a very early age. <clears throat> it's easy for somebody to think, well, there's no dark night of the soul for you. Uh, I mean, obviously there's regret at having killed somebody, but talk to us about the dark places it took you because I think yeah. it, that's yeah. an important part of the story that often is missed. Yeah. You know what I discovered through that? I started, had never really quantified it as the dark night of the soul, but as we talk through this, I can certainly uh, relate to your description. Um what I discovered through this in this five-year sabbatical was that I had great success, but no significance. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, nobody cared. I had a big house. Nobody cared. We had nice cars. Nobody cared. I had a beach house. Like, I'm not saying those things to boast. I'm just saying that nobody cared. No. And if I had been killed that day, my legacy would have been poor kid, from Nashville, Tennessee, makes enough money to retire at age 27, and nobody cares. Mm -hmm. And man, it really hit hard with me. And I started thinking, that's not what I want my legacy to be. I don't want my legacy to be that I made a little bit of money at an early age, and I provided a few tangible possessions, and I didn't have an impact or any level of significance for anybody's life. Like what I want my legacy to be is that Dove's life is better as a result of having interacted with me. Like we have this camaraderie. We have this ability to get together and challenge and encourage and edify and lift each other up. We have the ability to have deep, deep conversations that matter. And when I wrote my book, View from the Top, I titled that chapter Blindsided. See, because that's exactly what it did to me. I never saw this coming. 
and we never see it coming, right? No, of course not. It happened like a left hook for Mike Tyson. It came out of nowhere and it radically changed my life, but it did allow me to think through the things that were really important. Now, I don't want to completely dismiss success. No, because I don't want anyone to be demotivated. I hate it when people with money go, money's not important. And I'm like, yeah, let's take it away from you and see how important it is. But don't make it your God. Don't make it your only focus. Don't make it the only motivating force in your life. There's got to be deeper meaning. There's got to be deeper purpose. We were all put here for that. And we need to discover what that is. And once we rest in the fact that we understand what our purpose is, There's a deeper why I get up each and every day now. And so, yeah, would I have discovered it prior to that? Maybe not. I don't know. That's why I said I don't want to repeat the class, but I wouldn't take anything for it. I'm with you. I I don't want to repeat what happened, um, but I do not in any way, shape, or form want to take away the result of what happened. But I'm also clear for myself, I'm speaking about me, that the lesson would have not been possible without the event. I know that. I'd like right. to think I'm a pretty bright guy, right. and I'm a fairly enlightened human being, and I'm a pretty, you know, I understand things, but I am also clear that that lesson was not getting into my thick head without my head right. being smashed open on those rocks. Yeah, right. Right? And so do I want to repeat the lesson? Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Do, would I give up the lesson? Absolutely not. Could I have got the lesson without that? No. I'm clear. I, will say, I understand that. You and I were talking about a mutual friend that we have, Mike Michalowicz. Mike yep. was writing a new book. He interviewed both of us, actually, uh, yep. how that we can um, really learn these lessons without going through this dark night of the soul. And mm-hmm. so I do want to say as a word of encouragement to your listeners today We maybe cannot experience that on our own, but when you listen to people that you trust, possibly that we can get better, right? We we can do things at a far greater level. Like you don't always have to learn on your own dime, right? No. I'd rather learn on your dime than mine. And so pay attention to some of the things that we're saying. And if you trust Dove and you trust me, uh, think about how you could do some things differently, uh, before you have to go through that possible dark night of the soul. And that's a very good point. And one of the things that I like to tell people is this, is that, you know, I had to fall off a mountain. Aaron had to hit a pedestrian. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, those are pretty dramatic and, and challenging sure. things. But here's what I want you to know as you listen to us. And that is that... The fall, which is what I call it, right? The fall, yours was a fall, mine's a fall, just different forms. Sometimes it's a horrible diagnosis, a loss of a loved one or bankruptcy. There's all kinds of ways it can show up. But that fall, I believe, it's not the truth, it's what I believe. I believe is, comes dramatically because I believe the soul whispers first. The soul whispers, and if you don't listen, it whispers a few more times, and then eventually it will talk to you. And if you don't listen, it will scream at you, and eventually it might push you off a mountain. Mm-hmm. So my question to you is, do you have to wait to fall off the mountain, or can you listen to the soul's whispers? Yeah, And absolutely. that soul's whisper might be that you came off the edge of the curb and you twisted your ankle, and it mm-hmm. slowed you down. Mm-hmm. And instead of going, oh, well, I'll just put some ice on it, and I'll get back on running and what I'm doing, what if you go, well, what if that was the warning sign? What if that was the way to say, I don't have to go to the dramatic mm-hmm. event to have my own internal journey where, you know, as, as Jung talked about, where I can enter into the darkest part of my psyche and can discover what drives my soul. That, you don't have to go through the dramatic part. You can do it if you decide to do it. And as you very well pointed out, Aaron, and I think it's really important, I don't believe, and this is my truth, I don't believe you can do it on your own. Again, no one is subjective in their, nobody is objective in their subjective reality. You have to have a mastermind. You have to have a coach. You have to have a therapist. You have to have mentors. You have to have people you can trust who are not going to blow smoke up your skirt and just tell you you're wonderful. 
but are going to tell you sometimes a hard truth that might not be as easy to hear, but because they love you and you trust them, you'll listen. Yeah, I think we were designed to be in community. We weren't designed for isolation. Isolation Absolutely. is the enemy of excellence. And if we really want to excel at every area of our life, we need to be surrounding ourselves with non-biased, trusted advisors that don't have anything to gain or lose as a result of pointing out your superpowers, your kryptonite, your blind spots, people that know you intimately that can help you make these decisions. And so I couldn't agree more. Coaches, accountability groups, mastermind, board of directors, whatever you want to call them, we need people around us that know us intimately that can help us work through every scenario of our life. And don't, uh, and to just add to that, um, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Make sure that you're surrounding yourself with people who are smarter than you, not in everything. You've got your own excellence, but who can call you out and be there and speak to to your own blind spots. Thank you. I really appreciate that, Aaron. We are already at the end of part one of the show, loving our conversation, our delicious conversation. Aaron, before we uh, come back into part two of the show, I'd love for you to tell our, our listeners, our viewers, where they can find out more about you, uh, about your resources and all the wonderful yeah. things that you have. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that opportunity. Uh, you can reach us at viewfromthetop.com. Uh, we host mastermind groups. Uh, so that was a great segue into me mentioning that Iron Sharpens Iron is our community. We have unbelievable community and we're international and national. Uh, 15 groups currently. Uh, we're opening up new groups for people to come in. First time in four years I've opened any groups. And so uh, I really want to uh, continue to grow the brotherhood. So yeah, if you're interested, reach out viewfromthetop.com. Thank you. That's wonderful. So again, we'll make sure that those are posted in the show notes. So stay curious, my friends, stay curious about your, how you are being presented, presented with the opportunity to look inside. It doesn't have to be a dramatic dark night of the soul, but what if you just stopped and listened to the soul's whispers. We're going to be back for part two of our delicious conversation with Aaron in just one click. So stay tuned and we'll see you very soon. <laughs>